What am I looking at? How about you ask an actual veteran next time, Dice? It just keeps getting worse. This is a straight up wrong and disingenuous message. Real people gave their lives for these heroic operations, yet how does the game treat them? By replacing, ignoring, and utterly disrespecting their entire existence. The game's story begins with a prologue section which starts with this shot from Battlefield 1 of a World War 1 African American soldier of the 369th Infantry Regiment facing off with a German soldier. The 369th did mostly consist of African American forces who did see service in the Western Front during the later stages of World War 1. However, it was a segregated infantry regiment in the US military and was observed into French units when they entered World War 1, so it is inaccurate to see them mixed in with the white American soldiers seen among the bodies in the lower left of the screen. As more clearly seen in Battlefield 1, the Imperial German soldier is wearing an M15 Feld mantle with incorrect red piping, anachronistic World War II era Y straps, and also anachronistic 1939 Marsh Tiefel boots. While the Harlem Hellfighter, along with the other American forces seen among the bodies, instead of wearing correct US M1912, M1917 or M1918 tunics, have a British gear on, including a 1903 service dress, 1908 webbing and rain cape. The game then shows us a statue of the two soldiers in London, however this statue never existed in reality, and even if it did, it would probably make more sense for it to include a British soldier, rather than an American and German, since it's in London. The German Blitz bombing of London did not begin until the summer of 1940, not the game's presented date of 1939. The cutscene shows British forces being transported through London in loads of German Opel Blitz trucks. English Bedford OYD trucks would be a suitable replacement. Instead of having their correct pattern 37 or 40 uniforms, many of the British foot soldiers throughout the game are wearing incredibly inaccurate, and in this case anachronistic, American M1942 paratrooper jackets and pants painted in brown. As the name would suggest, this uniform was not even introduced until 3 years after this sequence in 1942. The British Brody helmets in game are all the original First World War Mark 1 version, likely reused from Battlefield 1, when they should be the newer Mark 2 model by now. The fella in the middle to the right is for some reason wearing winter camo pants. And they are all armed with Sten Mark 2 submachine guns, which were not introduced until June 1941. We then get brought to Norway to partake in a British paradrop during the 1940 Battle of Narvik, but in reality, no such British paradrop into Narvik occurred at all during this year. The paratroopers jump out of Douglas C-47s. This aircraft did not even have its first flight until December of 1941, over a year after the shown date. The historically not present British Airborne also have completely incorrect uniforms. They are again wearing the anachronistic American M1942 paratrooper jackets and pants, this time mostly painted in white, along with M1 paratrooper helmets which began production in the summer of 1941. The first British Airborne division was not even founded until 1941, so there is no real suitable replacement for them here since they simply did not exist yet in 19. The player jumps with the still very much so anachronistic Sten in hand ready to fire while descending, which was not done in reality. When we land we are immediately out of our jump harness, or are we just dragging our now invisible whole parachute behind us the whole time? Our melee weapon is a Fairburn Sykes Commando Knife, which is an anachronism here, since it was not produced until 1941. Some of the British soldiers, including our protagonist Billy Bridger in the later Under No Flag story, are wearing a non-military issued jacket based on a modern reproduction of a 1930s leather racing jacket. Some of the British paratroopers here are also armed with German FG-42s, which is not only incredibly misplaced, but also anachronistic since the first version of FG-42 was not put into service until 1943. Instead they should have more proper weapons like Lee Enfield rifles, Bren LMGs, etc. 
Among the wrecked ships in the Norvik port is a reused asset from Battlefield 1, being the British Navy's HMS Iron Duke. Its appearance here makes zero sense, as during this time the HMS Iron Duke was decommissioned, badly damaged and beached in Scapa Flow, Scotland. Many of the Vermac soldiers throughout the game have absurdly incorrect modern day Chinese PACA vests in a setup that vaguely resembles the uniforms worn by Italian paratroopers, but featuring MP40 magazines and worn over their standard issue Feld Blusa instead of jump smock. The common helmet insignias on the German Stahlhelms seem to be completely absent throughout the game's story mode. Some of the soldiers have M43 field caps which are anachronistic for this sequence and all other scenes set before 1943, so should be replaced by a side cap or M35 Stahlhelm where applicable. This model in particular is also wearing a civilian style trench coat instead of any army issue great coat or fell blusa. Throughout the game, all forces, including the German soldiers, drop a flashing British P-37 ammo pouches coloured in olive drab with an ammo patch slapped on. They contain bullets that apparently fit all our weapons, regardless of their calibre. This is of course a gameplay feature, but it is still obviously inaccurate and misplaced. Since the MP40 had only just been introduced in this sequence's setting of 1940, most of them should still be the older models such as the MP38. Also, MP40s were usually issued to NCOs and squad leaders. The majority of infantry throughout the whole game should have higher numbers of CAR 98Ks instead. Throughout the game, the German troops are seen using the MG-34 Panzerlauf on AA stands as their main mounted MG. This is very unlikely since this version of MG-34 was designed and used as secondary armaments in tanks and other armoured vehicles. Most of the ones in open air should be changed into regular MG-34s and MG-42s for the later missions on Lafette tripods instead. A Royal Air Force Spitfire is seen friendly firing at our position. The only British aircraft used during the actual Battle of Narvik in reality were much older swordfish biplane torpedo bombers from the HMS Furious, Sea Gladiators from the HMS Glorious, and 12 Hawker Hurricane Fighters of the 46 Squadron that engaged 2-3 German HE-111s but not during the land battle. No Spitfires were present during the fighting at all. The Narvik port town, especially around the iron ore shipping dock, was under the constant threat of shelling during the battle, meaning a blackout would be in place, yet the majority of the house's lights are all on in the distance. A tiger tank somehow appears on the iron ore shipping dock in 1940, two years before it first entered service. The tiger then transitions us to our next sequence in Libya 1941, where the tank's appearance is still anachronistic by at least one year. Brilliant dice. On the back of our tiger's turret is a fictionally designed tricolor flag of the German Empire that looks sort of similar to the Imperial German Navy Jack, but with a Balkan cruise instead of an Iron Cross. We go on to see this outdated customized flag appear in multiple other places throughout the game, even outside government buildings, despite the German Empire having ceased to exist in 1918. The terrain does not fit the Tobruk region at all. The area should be more flat with rolling hills rather than steep cliffs. Panzer IV F2 or Gs fight alongside us, even though they were not produced until a year after this sequence in March 1942. All of the Tigers and Panzer IVs in these early to mid-war periods should be replaced by the Panzer II and Panzer III. Like in many other media depictions of the North African campaign, this game features a complete lack of appearance or even mention of the theatre's highly prevalent Italian forces or any other allied force outside Britain, the US or France, not only in this sequence but for all the other scenes and levels set in North Africa, including the entire subsequent Under No Flag story. T-17E1 Staghound armoured cars show up at a minimum of three years too early, since this vehicle did not see combat until 1944. They should be British Daimler armoured cars instead. 
Alongside American M4 Sherman tanks not introduced until February of 1942. Even our commander refers to the tanks as American. Even though the US still had not even directly entered World War II by this stage. Even worse, some of the Shermans have American T-34 calliopes attached, which were not even designed until 1943 and not used in combat until early 1945. And the calliopes fire too big and incorrect rockets. They should be firing the rocket scene on screen now. Overall, the Shermans here should be replaced by Matilda Mark IIs or Crusader tanks. The British, American, or whoever these allied soldiers are even supposed to be anymore, instead of wearing standard khaki drill uniforms, are seen all still wearing the same white painted American M1942 paratrooper uniforms and motor racing jackets in a desert environment. German Pac-40 anti-tank guns are being shot at us, even though these did not enter service until 1942. It should be English QF-2 pounders instead for this scene, while the one we capture in the Under No Flag story should be a Pac-38 instead. In a random bit of friendly fire, the soldiers firing the Pac 40s at us are German, of course wearing the same white uniform from the Norway sequence. Also, the Pac-40 would usually have a crew of six to properly use, yet all the ones in game are operated by just a single soldier. Inside the watchtower is a single, standalone, French, colonial soldier armed with a German Panzerschreck not first produced until 1943. Considering the enemy tanks are approximately 500 meters away, your shells have far too much drop, especially since the muzzle velocity of the Tiger's 88mm cannon is 780 meters per second. Regardless of what variant of tank or what explosives we are using on it, all of the tanks in game will explode violently and have their turrets completely fly off upon being neutralized. This did occur in reality when the ammunition in the tank exploded, however for the most part these destructions should be less dramatic. The following sequence puts us as a colonial French soldier at Kasserine Pass 1942. When this game was first released, it incorrectly stated that Kasserine Pass was in Algeria instead of Tunisia. However, later updates then changed this to the correct location of Tunisia. But even with the game's updated info, it still makes no sense in terms of the year setting, since the Battle of Kasserine Pass took place in February 1943, not 1942. The French forces at Kasserine Pass were under the command of French General Edward Velver, whose objective during the battle was to hold the western hills that overlooked Kasserine. Contrary to the title of this little portion of the prologue, the French were not behind enemy lines at this point, as the enemy did not breach any of the French defences. Plus, three French forces were not deployed directly at the pass, but on the left flank of US forces. Although some had fallen back with the Americans, and small units were mixed together and thrown in the way of the Axis forces. Nevertheless, there is no exact evidence of the involvement of the TIA Senegalese behind the enemy territory as portrayed here. Kasserine Pass does not have any old Roman forts around the area in reality. The nearest one would likely be Budarius, which was located over 50 kilometers away. There is also no large canyon with a large arch bridge in the middle of it at Kasserine. Despite not trying to conceal themselves in the same ghillie wrapping, our French soldier is for some reason using a ghillie wrapped German Kart 98K sniper rifle. Realistically speaking, it should be replaced with a Labelle 1886, or at this point, considering that they were supplied by the British and Americans, a Springfield or Lee Enfield. The French forces use some sort of rocket launcher to fire against the convoy in the canyon. This is likely anachronistic, as the French forces may not have been supplied with the M1 bazooka at this time, and even if they were, they would be supplied to the non-colonial units as they took priority, and the use of any captured German launchers such as the Panzerfaust or Panzer Schreck would be anachronistic for the 1942 setting of this sequence. And speaking of the Panzer Schreck, during the engagement the German soldiers retaliate by firing a Panzerschreck rocket at our position. The soldiers crawling out of the destroyed Panzer IVs are wearing infantry attire, including helmets, instead of any proper tanker uniform. 
Our comrade next to us has olive drab US MK2 grenades. These grenades did not start getting painted olive until around 1943, so should still be painted in their pre-World War II bright yellow colour or replaced with French F1 or British Mills bomb grenades. The planes that fly over and destroy the bridge are BF-109s, which despite having no visible payload, can somehow drop a bomb large enough to destroy the pillars holding up one of the segments of the arch bridge. This is rather dangerously close here, as the Germans are literally less than 50 meters above the bomb explosion and not to mention are on the bridge itself. All of the aircraft in the desert settings in game lack any appropriate desert camouflage. As seen here in this BF-109, the pilots and gunners of all the aircraft in the actual gameplay, including the German ones, are World War I British pilots whose models were, yup, you guessed it, shamelessly ripped right out of Battlefield 1. All of the German fighters throughout the story mode have a yellow band on them, which tells us they are a part of Jagdgeschwader or JG-11, which was only formed in April 1943, so why they are seen before this year in Africa and Norway is anyone's guess. When JG-11 was formed, they only had three groups, as they were split from JG-1. This 109 has the markings for a fourth group 11 squadron, as indicated by the black lettering and half squiggle, which would make this fictional. We now transition into the perspective of a Luftwaffe BF-109 G2 pilot over Germany in 1943, where we will straight away see that the dials in our cockpit are messed up. The altimeter does not adjust when we fly up and down, the clock's minute hand moves far too fast, and the boost gauge by default is 0.8 ATA, which is alarmingly high for cruising speed. Also, the cockpit itself is modelled on the E version of BF-109, despite the outside build of the plane being modelled on the G2 variant. The cockpit should look like this to match the G2 model. Our pilot is referred to as Yellow 7. The actual Yellow 7 of JG-11 was a Fokker Wolf 190A6, not a BF-109. The game tells us that we are attacking the Royal Air Force Squadron number 114, which would be impossible in reality, as this squadron was operating in North Africa and in the Mediterranean theatre in 1943, not Germany. Also, the Royal Air Force as a whole at this stage did not even perform daytime bombing runs on Germany until much later in the war. The RAF is flying Bristol 142 Blenheims, which in reality were not used for bombing runs on German cities since 1940. They should be Lancaster or Halifax bombers instead. Additionally, the Bristol 142 Blenheims here seem to be based on the Mark IF, but they are missing their airborne interceptor radar. DICE have also merged several variants of the Blenheim into one plane it seems here, as they included the Mark IF's four barrel gun pod, but placed it under the nose instead of under the central fuselage. And they also include the Mark IV's remote controlled twin barrel pod, which wouldn't fit unless they included the Mark IV's extended nose to fit it under the co-pilot. All of the British aircraft have the outdated RAF roundel. After 1941, they should have been changed to the one seen here. Despite the game telling us that these Blemheims are of Squadron 114, they have GU letters on them, which means they are a part of Squadron number 18. Squadron 114 would have FD as their letters. The gunners of the Blemheims have a German MG-34s instead of their usual Vickers or M1919 Browning machine guns. Strangely enough, there are only three additional 109s attacking the bomber formation. However, German squadrons had 12 aircraft and 3 squadrons per group, so where are the other 109s? We can fire our machine guns indefinitely, without running out of ammo or even overheating. Spitfires were short-range fighters that were not used as cover bombers over Germany as they would not make it back to friendly territory with their limited fuel reserves. And the Spitfires themselves are the Mark V-B version, which would be really outdated by 1943. For this instance, they should be escort aircraft, such as the P-47 Thunderbolt or P-51 Mustang with drop tanks, while the rest of the Spitfires seen throughout the story mode should be the newer LF Mark 9s. 
Even when playing in max graphics settings, many of the aircraft are seen having no visible propellers or having completely static propellers. The last sequence of the prologue has us fighting during the 1944 Battle of Nijmegen in the Netherlands, next to Wallbridge. However, the side we're attacking from should be smack dab in the middle of the city. We should be advancing through ruined streets instead of bushes and trees. We also carry a M1911, which has a hammer that is always cocked back, only moving halfway through its animation. Its slide is only halfway locked back too. Also, most would rack the 1911 with their index and thumb at the rear to avoid cutting their hand on the sights. There seems to have been some sort of record-breaking severe drought in-game, because the entire Wall River is somehow completely absent here. What is supposed to be the Nijmegen Railroad Bridge is not correctly modelled on the bridge as it was in reality, with it particularly having differences in its columns. While the iconic road bridge, which should be located a few hundred meters upstream to the right, like the Nijmegen city as a whole, is completely missing in game. In reality, the crossing of the wall was primarily done by the 82nd US Airborne with fire support from the British 30 Corps tanks. While the 30 Corps tanks were also supported by British soldiers, the majority of the fighting and house and street cleaning here was done by the US Airborne Infantry, yet we see none of them throughout this sequence. Some of the Allied soldiers are seen wearing a pattern 1939 greatcoat. While the weather in September 1944 was not exactly warm, it is odd to see it so prevalent here, especially since the pattern 1939 was outdated by this point and should be replaced by the pattern 1940 instead. Other than the three or so commanders and officers we go on to see throughout the campaign, all of the soldiers on all sides completely lack any rank insignia, meaning that they all apparently have the lowest rank of private. They also have no unit insignia. The M4 Shermans in this segment are M4A376W Shermans, which were not operated by the British. Only the M4A1 and M4A4s were leased to the British. A more appropriate replacement would also be Sherman Fireflies. The German forces who fought during the Battle of Nijmegen consisted of elements of the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions, but in game there is absolutely no appearance or even mention of the SS at all throughout the entire game. Also, the Battle for the Wall Bridge in particular saw a bunch of these SS unit remnants along with Schwerhers Flakachteilung 576 defending. Yet in game, and also according to the wiki, all we face here are its version of Fallschirmjäger paratroopers, even though none of these were present during the fighting in reality. The ammo pouches worn by soldiers throughout the game often do not match with the guns they are wielding, with some of them also having way too many ammo types on them, such as this FG-42 wielding soldier who is for some reason carrying machine gun ammo as well as rifle and MP40 mag pouches. As we will go on to see get continuously worse, the Germans often have completely inaccurate or misplaced clothing items, such as the tanker crew's summer panzer trousers seen worn here. The M43 anno rack with almost correct but still off splinter tarn camo. And incorrect leather gaiters. The only German heavy artillery gun featured in game are 17cm Canona 18s. Since only 338 of these were ever made, they should mostly be replaced by the much more common 15cm SFH howitzers, along with 8.8cm flak artillery guns. The game shows the wall bridge area getting hit with a V1 rocket, which did happen in reality but only after the wall broke was captured, not during the battle. Among these various collections of scenes, the game shows us one of the 1940 Battle of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, featuring the game's butchered version of British soldiers, outside the growth of St. Lawrenskirt Cathedral. However, other than a single demolition team that was stationed in Pernish, far away from the cathedral, there was no British forces that took part in the battle in Rotterdam City, so should be replaced by the way more prevalent Dutch forces for this shot. The pilot of this German BF-109 is not only wearing the aforementioned PACA vest in the Italian paratrooper type setup, but also has on a British Royal Air Force C-type cap. 
We then get shown the back of a Storm Tiger. Only a total of 18 of these tanks were ever created between 1944 to 1945, and they never saw combat in any desert environment as incorrectly depicted here. The Storm Tiger also has the wrong tactical marking, it should be replaced with a Panzer Storm Mauser company marking. And the German soldier to the right is wearing the Hunter outfit from this game's multiplayer, which consists of a US flight jacket and modern day cargo pants. By just so far looking at this game's around 15 minute long prologue, we are already at just under 100 inaccuracies. That is an average of about 1 inaccuracy every 9 seconds. But do you know where you wouldn't find this? Do you know a free to play game crafted by developers that genuinely care for both foreign immersion and real attention to detail? A game with a fan base so keen on historical accuracy that they have on multiple occasions leaked classified government documents to further improve the game's realism. I am not even joking, this has happened about a dozen times. Yes lads, the legendary War Thunder has sponsored this video. War Thunder is a free online game that lets you engage in epic and intense PvP vehicle battles, with over 2000 authentically created tanks, planes, helicopters and ships spanning across over 100 years of history from the 1920s to now. You can customize your vehicles with camouflages, historical markings, and even 3D decorations like bush and equipment. Even the damage system is realistic, with the vehicles actually suffering damage to their parts and crew instead of just having generic hit points. By signing up with the channel's link below, you will receive huge exclusive bonuses, including premium tanks, a premium account, boosters and much more. War Thunder is available on PC, PlayStation and Xbox, including older generations, all for completely free. So before finishing this video, click the link down in the description or pinned comment to download War Thunder today. Now, back to the inaccuracies. The game's first war story is set in the spring of 1942 and begins with our protagonist Billy Bridger getting recruited from prison. I've got a little deal for you, I'm putting together a unit. His recruitment does seem to be based on when David Sterling recruited Paddy Main for the Special Air Service, or SAS. Paddy Main was arrested and thrown into prison in Alexandria, and David Sterling approached him and recruited him into the SAS. In game, our character is recruited into the Special Boat Service or SBS, however. What sort of unit? Tell me, Bridger. Do you like the seaside? There are no convicts in the SBS in reality. Despite George Mason being an officer, he has to bribe the guards for some reason. If he is the head of a new unit, then the top press would have just accepted the pardon for Billy Bridger. In a rather unrealistic and insensible military decision, just four soldiers are sent into enemy territory to perform the upcoming dangerous objectives. After the first few seconds, the two background soldiers then completely disappear for the rest of the story, leaving a ridiculously low number of just two soldiers, one of which being a freshly recruited convict, to be put in charge of executing this operation. Even worse, despite Mason and Bridger hitting the same airfield to destroy the same targets, they for some reason decide to split up. I'm gonna put my bombs on those planes over there, and you are gonna put yours on them there. This operation as a whole is also either fictional or based upon the SBS infiltration of the Greek island of Rhodes in the summer of 1942, better known as Operation Anglo, which involved a team of 14 British and Greek commandos attacking two airfields to destroy the German and Italian bombers based there. If this is the case, then the amount of combatants, date, and especially the location is way off, since this mission takes place in North Africa instead of Greece. Instead of wearing literally any appropriate British gear, Billy Bridger has on a Soviet pilot slash tanker goggles. Along with loads of American equipment, including an M7 shoulder holster, M1936 utility belt, US Marine Corps P41 trousers, and an M1923 pistol pouch. While over his aforementioned leather racing jacket, he wears a Yugoslav M56 SMG bag, which as the name would suggest, was not even created until the late 1950s. I mean, how? Even if the devs confused it for an MP40 mag pouch, it would still be misplaced. 
Our commander, George Mason, also wears the Soviet goggles and way too much American gear, including what looks to be a US general's belt, a M1911 holster and US jump boots, in addition to, get ready for this, modern day Polish WZ 2010 BDU trousers. Neither of these men are carrying very necessary water canteens nor any proper field gear to stay safe from the elements, including any rucksacks or bergens. An operation such as this could take troops into the night, and only lightly packed they wouldn't last. The two background soldiers are seen wearing much of the aforementioned American gear, with the fella on the left additionally having US gaiters, and a modern day civilian branded Britannia winter jacket in brushstroke camo. While the one on the right notably wears modern day cargo pants and goddamn German Africa Corps boots. Billy Bridger is said to have made the uh, Safe Cracker Specials. Are you sure about these bombs of yours? These Safe Cracker Specials? However, these are Luz bombs, and Bridger did not make them. They were made by Lieutenant Jock Luz of L Detachment SAS. Despite the game starting us with an M1928A1 Thompson, our character always has a sten in the cutscenes. This inconsistency between the weapons had in the gameplay versus the cutscenes is prevalent throughout all the other missions as well. This Thompson and many other weapons throughout the game are equipped with a Gibbs magnified lens, which was a World War I era prototype sight, so should absolutely not be this widespread. The selector switches on all guns are not animated. Here we find a Dalil carbine. Only 129 Dalil carbines were ever built and were mostly used by British SOE, not Germany. And they weren't even put into service until 1943 and saw no combat use until 1944. Its bolt head incorrectly tilts up with the bolt. On the German crates throughout the game are American 12 gauge shotgun shells. Even among the German forces, this still anachronistic FG42 is way too common, since just about 7000 of them were ever built, and they are incorrectly seen used by standard Herr soldiers instead of the Fossumjäger paratroopers that it was designed for and used by in reality. We can find the Germans somehow having World War I era American Remington Model 8s among their supplies. Model 8s were used in small numbers by French Annuatique Militaire during the Great War. The SDG 44 is anachronistic to appear in this 1942 mission, since it did not enter service until 1943. Even if it was some sort of fictional prototype, it was still being called the MP43 before being referred to as the MP44 and then later SDG 44 within the year 1944. The STG-44s in this story are somehow equipped with a British Mark III free-mounted gun reflector sight meant for aircraft, which somehow reflects here even without a battery. Many of the weapons have ridiculous bright camo paints. German medics throughout the game are incorrectly armed with more than just a sidearm, and have different ammo pouches from their weapons too. They also carry the Battlefield 1 crutches, which would be pretty useless in an active combat zone like this. The Wehrmacht soldiers are seen having the Gewehr 43, which as the name would suggest was not introduced until 1943. It should be the earlier Gewehr 41 instead. The Panzerfaust did not enter service until a year after this level in 1943. In this instance it should be replaced by a Panzerbusche anti-tank rifle. All MGs overheat too fast after around 51 rounds. The amount of shots is irrelevant, the rate of succession is the important factor. Despite the MG's barrel becoming visibly red hot, our character never changes the barrel. Some of the weapons have a mounted 1945 vintage NIDAR Model 47 reflex sight, a device made for hunting shotguns. This sight never saw any actual combat use, and was not even particularly popular with the civilian market either, due to them being rather fragile, meaning that its appearance here is both anachronistic and misplaced. German officers are seen wearing a British officer cap with Royal Navy insignia. A tanker jacket. 
and ridiculous grey and black camo pants in the desert. Note that all the game's models were 3D rendered into the game, meaning that someone at DICE had to go out, secure each of these clothing items, physically put these outfits together and render them into the game. This was all done apparently without anyone throughout the process stopping to look at the absolute monstrosities of uniforms they were creating. These quote unquote officers also have torn FUD2 radios on their backs. When used in the field, this radio required a team of at least two to use, one of which to carry its large battery that is completely absent in game. The soldiers using them would also be basic radio men, known as Funkas in German. The airfield should be defended by Luftwaffe personnel from the Reichsarbeinstitz, not the games presented mad mashup of weirdly dressed troops. Here we use a Volkssturmgewehr which did not enter service for another 3 years starting in 1945. The original purpose of this gun was to serve as a last ditch weapon, originating from the primitive weapons program and intended to be mainly used by the Volkssturm militia units that only became a thing in late 1944. The Volkssturm Gewehr is attached with a post-World War II British Parker Hale Model 4 sight designed for the Lee Enfield. The Volkssturm Gewehr is incorrectly called 1 to 5. This is due to a mistake made by the American officer who wrote the name down. There are the Volkssturm Gewehr, Volkssturm 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. He just wrote it down as 1 to 5 either out of laziness or not knowing better. In line with classic video game logic, all of the shotguns have a pathetic range in contrast to reality. On the German Opel Blitz trucks that are being actively driven, we can find the British Royal Armour Corps Flash Crusader Stripes tactical marking. The enemies throw American M18 smoke grenades at us, which is both misplaced and anachronistic, since the M18 was not even designed until late 1942 and did not become standard issue until late 1943. For the German forces, they should be using Nabelhemd Granata 39 smoke grenades instead. Despite being the most produced German grenade of World War II, the massively media underrepresented M39 egg grenade is never seen used in game. The JU87B Stukas in game have gun pods beneath their wings, meaning that they are either G1 or G2 variants, which were not produced until months after the setting of this level in November of 1942. The yellow band on the back was only seen on Stukas on the Eastern Front. It should be a white band for North Africa. And they have 5E as their unit ID, but there is no Luftwaffe unit with 5E as their ID. We can see and hear the Stukas having their iconic Jericho trumpets, even though these were immediately phased out of service by the end of 1940 due to them becoming little more than a warning to the enemy that they were about to be attacked. The bombs being dropped by the enemy aircraft look to be 112 pound British World War 1 bombs, likely once again reused from Battlefield 1. On top of the defending forces not being Luftwaffe, there is apparently no ground crew, mechanics or pilots at any of the game's airfields. At one stage a Stuka even lands outside a hangar and the pilot is seen incorrectly wearing infantry attire with the goofy uh, PACA vest again of course. The Flak 38 is fed with a 20 round box magazine, yet the ones in game are never reloaded and have infinite ammo. The Flak 38 requires a crew of 5 to properly operate, yet her allied character somehow can single handedly use them with great success. All of the AA and AT guns lack any appropriate desert camo. The Volkswagen Kugelwagen driver is wearing white winter gear in the desert. In reality, the left barrel of the M30 Luftwaffe drilling shotgun was left on cocks to fire slugs, but in game both barrels fire buckshot. And the ejected shells aren't fired. We can find two different road signs throughout this story, one pointing east and one pointing west. They include a list of North African locations that would be way too far away from each other to even be listed on the same sign. And as seen on the map on screen, many of the locations are indicated as being in the complete wrong direction. 
the outdated Austria-Hungarian Steyr Mannlicher M1895-30 was used by German police and Volsturm during World War II, but not frontline soldiers. It is equipped with a ZF4 scope that is mounted with an anachronistic late war swept back style sniper mount. It is shown incorrectly using the round headed 8x50 MMR rounds instead of the sharp headed 8x56 MMR rounds. Multiple Irma EMPs are found throughout these missions. Around 10,000 of these were ever made in total and were last widespread used during the Spanish Civil War in the late 1930s. They were also adopted in small scale by the SS and German police, but neither of these forces are present in game, making the weapon's appearance among frontline hair soldiers at this stage misplaced and too common. This FG-42 is attached with a sight from an American M1919 30-cal MG that were used for AA mounts. Despite our objective being to destroy the airfield and its planes, we completely ignore the Park Stukas. We can even steal one, which our character knows how to fly. Somehow. These camo covers were never used by the Wehrmacht in reality. Most pits would have a Zeltban cover over the top instead. In line with classic Hollywood logic, we can blow up vehicles and fuel barrels by shooting them with regular bullets. The game even makes an objective of using them to blow up the airbase. The camo of this JU-88 appears to be Brune Violet and Hell Grune, daytime camo, which only became popular from 1944 onwards. The JU-88's role changed to a night bomber slash fighter after 1942, so it should not even have a daytime camo at all at this stage. The bombs found around the airbase are incorrectly painted SC-500s. They should be grey or a sky blue colour. The German bases have crates filled with World War I era 84mm British artillery shells that have been resized to be much smaller than their real life counterpart. Yet another Battlefield 1 reused asset. The MG42 was not introduced until the summer of 1942, making it anachronistic to appear in the springtime setting of this story. And even if it did appear in this year in a more appropriate time setting, it would have the slab sided horizontal charging handle instead of the post 1943 vertical handle we see in game. Also, the pivoting lever inside the top cover of the MG42 is in the wrong position. Despite never being adopted by German forces in reality, the Swiss SIG KE-7 is present among the Wehrmacht soldiers in game. A British Enfield Cup type rifle grenade launcher mounted on a modified shortened SMLE model is a dedicated gadget that the German forces have for some reason. We can find sticky dynamite sticks that stick to any surface they are thrown at. Sticky grenades did exist in World War II, but they had a non-stick handle on them to use. The dynamite in game does not however, meaning that they should also stick to our character's clothes and hands but apparently don't. Despite the dynamite sticks having made in Britain on them, they are found among German supplies. It is possible that some of them would have been captured explosives, but all of them being British, even in the later missions where there are no British forces involved, does not match up. The detonator used to blow them up is based on an American plunger, which also apparently has a wireless technology, because there is no fuse connecting the detonator to the dynamite. Many of the hair soldiers are wearing way too warm clothing for the desert environment, including the aforementioned civilian style trench coats, in addition to winter textured scarves and even cold weather masks. A few of them also have their color tabs on their field shirt, which is incorrect and not regulation. M43 anoraks anachronistically reappear in these 1942 levels. The German reinforcements have American MK2 grenades on them, even though US forces at this point still had not even arrived to North Africa yet. Even if they did somehow have them, they would be, as aforementioned, still painted yellow. 
The radar installations we destroy are smaller in scale, Versberg Roy's tracking radar dishes, which were never used in North Africa. Even if they were, these installations were known for being incredibly heavy and hard to transport across rough terrain, so it's unlikely to be found at the very top of a random hillside town. Even more so when another one is at the bottom of the town less than a 5 minute walk away. It seems that DICE does not know how gun laying radars work, as these radar installations are meant for AA gunners to track targets better, but there is a severe lack of AA pieces around this town. Also, the Würzburg Rise itself is anachronistic, as it is the D model that only had just been introduced to replace the C in 1942. The Rise itself was an upgrade to the D model, which would have been made sometime in 1942. Inside the radars we find English labels. We can find a belt fed version of the MG34 in this level, giving us a better look at how the pivot arm appears to be set in the wrong position and the bolt appears to be in the forward position despite the slot in the feed tray being blocked and the recoil spring being visible throughout the entire reload animation, even with the empty reload animation. German machine gunners in game do not hold their MGs by the bipod when hip firing as required by their training and doctrine, instead choosing to hold them by the barrel without gloves thus risking getting burnt. We can find suppressed CART 98Ks with a sniper scope. These would be extremely rare as they would mostly be used by the Brandenburgers or snipers behind enemy lines. To further add to the ridiculous nature of our character's operation, they were apparently not even given a rendezvous point as they would in reality, with Bridger instead using an enemy's radio to call for extraction. We'll need an evacuation sign. You know, just don't leave us behind. Which causes the German forces to learn of their location, somehow well after they left a the communication bunker, even though Bridger never even mentioned any Pacific location for the Germans to follow them to, let alone how they understood his English. But regardless, you would think that new recruits would be taught radio discipline. The radio set that Bridger uses here and is seen in many other places throughout this game is a Hagen Nuke 5K 39B which is a Kriegsmarine radio set for naval installations, harbour control etc. Certainly the wrong type of radio to be used for Luftwaffe ground crews. A better alternative would be the Funkerat type of radio. The ship our characters depart from and get rescued by at the end of the story is once again the same World War 1 era HMS Iron Duke model from Battlefield 1, which in 1942 was still beached in Scapo Flow, Scotland, not the Sussex. Even if it was correctly modelled on the HMS Sussex, it would still not make sense since the Sussex at this time was undergoing extensive repairs and did not return to service until August of 1942 months after the spring setting of this mission. Among the German crates are American M1A1 carbines, which is not only misplaced but also anachronistic, since the US military did not start producing the M1 carbine until July of 1942, not spring. And the rear sight of the M1A1 carbine is way too thin and wide. Panzer IV Alft H's, with their iconic turret and side skirts, appear as an anachronism, since they were not introduced until a year after this level in the summer of 1943. The AB markings on these Spitfires mean they are either number 1557 radio aids training, flight RAF, or number 423 squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force. The first was only a training squadron, and the latter was not even created until 1943, so either way it's wrong. All the Spitfires incorrectly do not have any camo pattern, and instead are a constant OD green colour. The only Spitfires that would have one tone camo would be Photo Recon Spitfires. The Spitfires are only equipped with their cannons. To attack an armoured column like this, they should have appropriate CAS ordnance, like bombs and rockets, and especially considering their short range as fighters, Hurricane Mark IIs or Bristol bow fighters should make an appearance alongside them. Yup, that is three of the exact same HMS Iron Duke models right next to each other. They at least tried to conceal them by having them destroyed and far away in the Narvik scene, but this here is just them not even trying to hide their laziness anymore.
The next war story brings us back to Norway in the spring of 1943 to participate in an assault on the Vermont hydroelectric power plant to destroy the German supply of heavy water, an ingredient of nuclear bombs. The Vermont plant in game is seen as being completely remote high in the mountains, as if it was located in the northern Norwegian Alps. However, in actuality, it was located in the south, outside the town of Rukan, located about 200 kilometers away from Norway's capital capital of Oslo, so was surrounded by trees and greenery rather than large empty stone cliffs. Weber mentions that there was a British commando raid on the facility three days ago. For three days ago, the elite British commando troops were out for a raid. We helped the technicians here. The angrepe looked at it. They were dropped and we found it. The operation that Weber is talking about here is very likely meant to be the SOE Operation Freshmen, which occurred in November of 1942 and ended up in failure. However, Nord Lee's date setting is in spring 1943, three days after Operation Freshmen would make it the 22nd of November 1942, so it is not even the correct year. The British commandos are seen both in the cutscene and in the gameplay getting executed and then buried shortly after the raid, just a few hundred meters from the power plant. However, in reality, the survivors of Operation Freshman were taken to Greena POW camp near Oslo, where they would be tortured, killed and later buried at sea. The remaining commandos had crashed on the southwestern coast and were thrown into an unmarked mass grave nowhere near the power plant. Also, the British commando getting executed here in the cutscene is wearing a German Stahlhelm on his head. The story's date and location does however match up with Operation Gunnerside, which involved six Norwegian agents parachuting into the area to join forces with four other Norwegian commandos from Graus, a previous operation to freshmen. They successfully attacked the Rukan plant on the night of the 28th of February to the 1st of March 1943, with the loss of 500 kgs of heavy water and the destruction of the heavy water section of the plant thus heavily halting Germany's nuclear research, in a move that got this game infamous for its utter ignorance and rewriting of history, it features a fictionalized series of events and replaces the real heroic veterans involved in this operation with some made up mother and her daughter, even though no female combatants were involved in the actual raid, with it only giving a very small credit to the real operation and its commandos with a single line at the very end of the story. The game models the Vermont power station quite well to its real life counterpart, and features some very randomly accurate details, such as when it shows our characters putting paper clips on their collars. Paper clips were used by the Norwegian resistance to identify each other, or how Weber speaks Norwegian and tells us that he grew up in the country, which matches with how Norway took in many German refugees during the First World War. This means that DICE did do their research and were very much so aware of all of this, and could have created an honourable and at least somewhat accurate story for these levels, but instead chose to completely ignore the facts and instead made all this stuff up seemingly to make the game more gender diverse. If it was diversity they were after, then there are literally thousands of actual stories of female soldiers in World War II that they could have based our story on instead, such as Soviet snipers, the night witches, or the many resistance women fighters in forces like the Free French. All they achieved with this rewriting of history here was pissing off the fanbase, misleading some of their more impressionable audience by presenting all this bullshit in a very dramatic and serious tone, overall creating in what is considered by many as the single most utterly disrespectful butchering of history in the entire mainstream gaming industry. Despite the importance of the heavy water and a British attack just recently happening, the commander for the entire facility is Weber, a sympathetic German who grew up in Norway with the single lowest officer rank of lieutenant. Our protagonist, Solvay, is wearing a US A4 mechanic cap dyed black. This is likely a stand-in for a cap comforter. But she also wears what appears to be a strange mix of the US M1942 and M1947 reversible parka. Where did she get all this American equipment from? Who knows. She also wears modern day, of course, branded royal vintage trousers. 
and Cold War Era Swiss Army Gators. Dice Costumes Department coming in strong again, lads. In reality, there was a single bridge that crossed a steep gorge in front of the plant at Rukan. However, it was much smaller, was only made for pedestrians, and did not have the passageway underneath it that is present in game. The bridge is also located in the wrong spot. It should be in front of the plant, not off to the side. And as seen in this picture, it should connect to a small collection of houses, but these are absent in game. The default melee weapon of Sulvai is a French World War 1 era M 1916 scout knife. Among the German equipment is an American M1911 with a silencer. It should be replaced by a more appropriate German pistol or perhaps even the M1911 copy by the Norwegian factory Kongsberg Wuppenfabrik, popularly known as Kongsberg's Colt. Along with their conveniently laid out silenced weapons, the Germans have a throwing knives amongst their supplies, which can apparently instantly kill any enemy by throwing just a single one anywhere on them. One of the weapons found in the watchtowers is a Czechoslovakian ZH-29, which was never in service with the German army. Instead of its usual 32 round mag, the MP-28-2s here have a 50 round mag from the British Lanchester SMG. It also has a MG-42's 1943-era muzzle brake on it. There should be Norwegian staff like mechanics and scientists throughout the facility, although it could be forgiven due to the recent attack since the Germans might have sent the mechanics home or have them detained and questioned by the Gestapo, a complete lack of them however seems very off. For example, one of the main reasons for the actual Operation Gunnerside's victory was because a patriotic caretaker named Johansson decided to assist the Norwegian commandos and let them inside the facility to perform their mission. The German flamethrower wielding troops seen throughout the story mode are armed with a bastardization of the wand of the Vexel Apparat M1917 from Battlefield 1 and what appears to be fuel tanks from the eventually added M2 flamethrower. Assumedly this contraption is supposed to be a stand-in for the Flammenwerfer 35. These flamethrower troops wear a completely out of place M41 Africa Corps tunic. Despite not wearing any visible additional armour, the enemy soldiers armed with this flamethrower are much more resilient to gunfire than standard infantry. Not to mention how dangerous it is to protect such important locations like this behind enemy lines with such units, and how the gas tanks explode every time despite us just shooting them with regular bullets. To cause a tank to explode like this would be very hard to do and would need a load of luck or special bullets to achieve in reality. For god knows what reason, the electronic substations have a big self-destruct switch that completely blow them all up upon pulling. We can find the Germans having the aforementioned M30 Luftwaffe drilling shotguns. In reality only about 2500 of these were ever created, and were supplied to Luftwaffe pilots in North Africa for hunting and self-defense. Its appearance close to the airfields in the earlier North Africa missions was acceptable, but anywhere else such as here in Norway is absolutely not. Here we pick up a suppressed Finnish KP-31 SMG, however the suppressor design is not even from World War II, it looks like it may be a 1990s design but sources vary on the matter. Fabrikken produserer tungt vann, en nøkkelingeriens i en ny forferdelig bomba som tyskerne utvikler. The German command only planned to remove the heavy water from the Rukan facility in February of 1944, a year after this story. The body of water that our character arrives at here is likely meant to be Lake Tin, which was where the supply of heavy water was destroyed during transport in reality. This map we find around the level even further indicates this. However, the landscape, surrounding buildings and especially the climate do not match up with the real place. Southern Norway and the Oslo Greater Area reported no snow after February, but lots of light drizzles, meaning that it should not be as snowy, the lake and especially Especially the flowing river should not be seen completely frozen over, and there certainly should not be these crazy blizzards. 
At the start of this level, we can find a British Piat launcher. As of early 1943, this weapon had only recently entered service. It and the many Brens we find among the Wehrmacht weapons does not really match up. They couldn't have been captured from the previous British raid either, since those commandos would have been wielding Stens or Thompsons in reality. As a matter of fact, the commandos involved in the successful Operation Gunnerside purposefully left behind one of their Thompson SMGs to show the German force Forces that it was a foreign intervention. You cannot fire the Piat until you have it deployed with the stock firmly pressed into your shoulder. The recoil on this thing could dislocate your shoulder if not correctly positioned, so firing it while running and gunning as we can in game would be nigh impossible in reality. Also, we can somehow refill our Piat with rockets from the Panzerfaust. Among the evidence that we have to destroy is a picture of a BMW 340, a car that was not first produced until 1949. Far off on the lake is, wouldn't you guess it, more goddamn British World War I Iron Dukes. How they and the subsequent U-boat even got here is a mystery, since the rivers connecting Lake Tin to the sea would be way too skinny for them. These Iron Dukes were also apparently occupied by the Germans, since they are firing at us, rather illogically, when everyone is on the ice, which somehow does not result in it all breaking and everyone drowning. Despite taking place in 1943, this U-Boat Type 7 is equipped with a Flak 38 2cm MIT LC-30-37. By 1943, the Kriegsmarine was doing everything they could to increase the firepower of their anti air of the Type 7s. This included changing the Koning Tower to house additional guns. Seeing as this is a basic Type 7, this would make the sub a little anachronistic. Not only did the extraction of the heavy water, as aforementioned, not occur until a year after this level, but the heavy water itself was also transported across Lake Tin by a railway ferry known as FS Hydro, not a U-boat. The SF Hydro and the heavy water it was carrying was then blown up by a four-man crew led by Norwegian resistance fighter Knut Heitlig, so absolutely not by a sacrifice from this fictional mother. Our next war story starts with an elderly version of our protagonist Deme Cisse telling us about his quote unquote forgotten service as a colonial French soldier from a unit known as the Tiraya Senegalese. In Provence during the invasion of southern France, codenamed Operation Dragoon in the autumn of 1944. Instead of showing any of the actual many written resources on Operation Dragoon or the Tiraya Senegalese, such as La Première Armée, which includes non-French soldiers on the cover, the game instead presents us with this completely made up book consisting of only white soldiers on the cover with a title that translates to Faces of World War II, seemingly in an attempt to back up Deme's exaggerated and straight up factually incorrect argument and message which progressively gets worse throughout this story, but more about that later. We also see the magazine called Le Esprit, but is way different to how they normally look. Our now younger protagonist Deme disembarks from a landing ship tank 542 class, but only 12 soldiers, including Deme, leave the ship. Normally, these types of ships would be offloading materials such as vehicles, a lot of cargo, or hundreds of soldiers. It's rather strange that only a handful of men are leaving the ship to join squads. Supplies and forces at this time were flooding into southern France, so it does not match up to why it is so relatively quiet with slow offloading. The Churchill Mark 7 can be spotted on the docks. The French never used Churchills at all. It should be a Sherman instead. The scenery behind our character's brother Idrissa shows quite the town or city that even has its own tram lines. Our characters, although not specifically specified in game, would have to be a part of the 9th Colonial Infantry Division which landed in the La Lella Vundair area around D plus 9. No port town or city in this area matches with the scale and look of the one seen in game however. Once again, our allied soldiers are seen driving German Opel Blitz trucks. If we're supplied by American forces as in reality, then a GMC truck would be a better choice. On disait, nous sommes français. Nous sommes français. Mais, une fois en France. Nous 
nous avons vu à quel point nous étions français. C'est tout C'est tout ce que l'on va faire Et comme tout a échoué, notre jeune et ambitieux capitaine a décidé de nous porter volontaires pour s'emparer des canons anti-aériens armants qui l'encerclent. What Just know why were the rifles taken from them? What is this enemy at the gates? The French army had plenty of weapons after being supplied by the Americans and British for nearly two years. The TIAs were brought to southern France to serve as combatants. So this idea that they were forced into non-combat roles and only being allowed to enter battle from an order from their captain is completely unfactual. <laughs> The entirety of the French army in this war story were World War I era uniforms ported over from Battlefield 1. While this would have been more so accurate in 1940, it would not be the case here, based on images from this time. All of the Senegalese and NATO French troops in 1944 should be wearing American infantry uniforms by now and occasionally equipped with M26 Adrian or Mark II Brody helmets. Moreover, the World War I uniforms they do have in-game are quite terrible, as they're all incorrectly coloured and feature German leather white straps with anachronistic post-World War II French M1945 pouches. Our convoy gets attacked by Stukas, which by 1944 were almost exclusively used for night attacks. They also still somehow have their aforementioned Jericho trumpets which were phased out of service by the end of 1940. The Shusha is a World War I era weapon that would be very outdated for this late World War II battle. The French army finally stopped using the Shusha in 1940 when they surrendered, so their appearance here should be rarer since then, while our secondary, the Ruby Pistol, would also be very outdated but still somewhat possible to be present. Overall, we should be armed with a more appropriate American or British supplied MG like the Bren. It is also worth noting that almost all of the other Senegalese troops in game are equipped with only Lee Enfield rifles. Instead, they should be equipped with a mix of British and American armaments, especially the Springfield M1903A3 as shown in historical photographs. When reloading round by round, our character loads the Lee Enfield with invisible bullets. The game incorrectly shows the TIS as completely segregated colonial units. However, in reality, mixed race or even white soldiers born in Morocco and Senegal also served in these units with their indigenous brothers in arms, yet are not seen at all in game. Despite all the events being a part of Operation Dragoon and in the Provence region, the mission's environment does not match up with this at all. Dragoon took place in a Mediterranean environment in late summer. The mission shows temperate forests with brown or reddish colours of autumn. This may be due to the fact that according to info left by one of DICE's developers, the forests in this mission are based on scans from Puzzlewood in the UK. After further research, we concluded that our current Characters of the 9th Colonial Infantry Division at this time were in a sector near the Dube Commune in the Jura mountain range of the French and Swiss border. They stayed there until halfway through November when a breakthrough was made. By the 21st of November they were in Mulhouse in the Vourges region on the German border. So maybe DICE did do something right here since the Jura mountains battles are matched with the terrain and environment in game. However the beginning description of this campaign mentions only the Provence region and Operation Dragoon, which causes much confusion and questionable inaccuracies here. Not only would the German forces not have had the time and resources to build the extensive defensive line this far inland, but it is also positioned in the middle of a countryside to defend nothing significant. After the Allies had secured a foothold, there was almost no resistance apart from the cities. It does however look similar to the Siegfried Line on the French and German border, but in terms of location this would make zero sense, as we've already established. We are tasked with taking out the quote field guns, and the guns shooting at us seem to be used that way, but the models show that they are AT guns, specifically Pac-40s. 
The destroyed Shermans in the trenches are M4A3 Shermans, which the Free French did not have at this time, as it was only after Operation Dragoon that they would be supplemented with M4A3 Shermans to make up for the losses suffered. They should instead be equipped with the M4A2 and M4A1 Shermans that the 5th Regiment of Africa Chasseur, which was the regiment that fought with the 9th Colonial Infantry from Dragoon to the Vouge, was reported to have used in reality. We locate here the still anachronistic Volsturm Gewehr, this time one that fires full auto, despite the fact that all the Volsturm Gewehrs that were combat used during World War II were semi-auto only. This Volsturm Gewehr also, rather inaccurately, has a US first aid Carlisle pouch on its stock. We can find the German forces having the aforementioned Finnish KP-31 Sumi. Its appearance earlier in Norway was forgivable, as this weapon was known to be used in limited numbers by the Wehrmacht Army Norway. For France, however, the KP-31 Sumi's appearance is impossible, as there is no recorded use of it in the country during this time. When approaching, our character calls this bunker the enemy headquarters. Le QG ennemi est droit devant. I can assure you that a headquarters would not be on the front of a defensive line with huge guns in it. What am I looking at? No seriously, what are they trying to blend in with? Their own blood that will be easily shed from wearing such ridiculously bright colours into the battlefield? They do have the base shapes for hair splinter tarn, although slightly oversized, but they have completely wrong colours. I mean how is it even possible to mess up the colours this bad? Throughout this mission, we come across summary executions of wounded TRRs. While this would have been accurate if the story took place in 1940, as there were notable massacres against the Senegalese troops that year, there were no reported war crimes against the TRRs during Operation Dragoon. Here we find a random paratrooper or crash pilot hanging from a tree at the German roadblock. The skin is wrong though, as it is the game's version of a regular French infantry uniform. The M43 anoraks worn by some of the German soldiers are now incorrectly coloured with a dark green shade. They should instead be Sumpstarn camo, splinter or mouse grey. The German units in the campaign are seemingly well equipped and often appear as elite units. In the beginning of the third mission, Deme even mentions them as being Folsom Jaegers. Despite the troops, just like they were in the earlier Nijmegen Bridge section, looking nothing like actual Folsom Jaegers. In reality, the German 19th Army stationed in southern France should mostly consist of under equipped and under strength hair forces, many of them Ostruppen. During the operation, some capable units like the 11th Panzer Division should be fighting against Americans further up north instead. In the Dues Department, there should be remnants of the Army Group G, possibly the 38th Corps, and especially the aforementioned 11th Panzer Division, which were the last ones to hold out in southern France, since German forces involved in Operation Dragoon made a mad dash to retreat to the border after the Allies had landed in the region. So overall, Foltrimjägers being present here is very unlikely. Demay is handed a light pistol 34 to start the attack at the village. A French flare pistol would be more appropriate, such as the M1917. The village has a Panzer IV F2 being worked on. Most if not all of the Panzer IV F2s were replaced by the Aus G version by mid-1943. Not to mention that the French did not run into any Panzer forces by this point during Operation Dragoon. The main Panzer unit, the 11th Panzer Division, was currently holding the Rouen Valley against the American 36th, 45th and 3rd Divisions at Moltilimar. The rockets of the half-tracks with Verframen 40 somehow are able to fire within an absurdly short distance. Its minimum fire distance in reality was at the lowest in the hundreds of meters. Some of the TIR Senegalese are equipped with M1A1 carbines, despite being mainly used by the US Airborne Forces in reality. We can find a integrally suppressed Sten Mark II S in this level, which we can fire full auto. This is very impractical, however, due to overheating. Integrally suppressed Stens are meant to be fired in short bursts or semi auto. All British supplied Sten Mark II S's had their firing selectors fixed to semi auto only. 
Thanks to information left behind by one of DICE's developers, we know that this chateau is misplaced, as it is apparently based on Chateau de Joux, located on the French and Swiss border, and quite close to the Alps. This would match more closely with what we mentioned earlier about the 9th Colonial Infantry Division being in the sector near the Douves department. But the misleading description at the beginning of the campaign about the Provence region and Operation Dragoon still makes this all not add up. A tiger tank? How did the Germans even get a tiger tank into the chateau in the first place? The doors are way too small for it to even fit, and the terrain is rocky and steep, without any paved roads at all. These tanks were notorious for being logistical nightmares to transport and use. Not only this, but there is no tactical purpose to have a tank in a fortified, elevated position like this chateau. Not to mention how strange it would be to appear among such understrength German units. As for the replacement of the tank, we found that in 1943, the aforementioned 11 Panzer Division was mostly equipped with Panzer Trees and Fours. Considering the lack of resources allocated for the German tank units, it is very likely that those Panzer Trees and Fours would still be the main bulk of their division by 1944. <laughs> The Turner SMLE was a prototype semi-auto conversion of the Lee Enfield and was never even adopted in any capacity by the British nor anyone else. Our character misranks his captain by referring to him as Commandant, French for Commander, which the game's subtitles then incorrectly translate to Sir. Merci mon commandant. Quand l'armée française a libéré Paris, ils ont retiré tous les soldats noirs. In reality, US forces agreed to equip the French with three armored divisions. However, in return, the US forces did not want any black soldiers in these tank divisions. The French then had no other choice but to accept. So before the French 2nd Armored Division even went to England before D-Day, all of its black forces were transferred to other units, many of whom ended up fighting during Operation Dragoon. However, all of this happened months before the liberation of Paris, not just before or when they liberated Paris, as incorrectly indicated by Deme here. It is also worth mentioning that not all Africans were absent at Paris, as there were about 1,300 North Africans present during the liberation of the city. As briefly mentioned earlier, the premise of this war story is completely inaccurate and plain wrong. The Senegalese and Moroccan tirailleurs were the highest decorated unit in the French army during World War II, outpacing NATO French divisions. The tirailleurs also fought with a great distinction during World War I as well. To depict them as a completely segregated and ignored force that were forgotten and even purposefully wiped out of the margins of history is ridiculous. However, one of the last largest issues that plagued the TIAs was in regards to benefits, civil rights and pay in post-war France. The footnote of the actual structural racism that these men faced after their service ended in 1945 was immense and not to be ignored, however not to be confused with when they were actually fighting. DICE would have been made aware of all of this if they had actually asked a real TIA Senegalese veteran, instead of just completely making this character and his inaccurate story and message all up. Now moving on to what is considered the game's best war story, The Last Tiger. Within the opening text it states that, quote, a tiger crew would often run out of ammunition before the enemy ran out of tanks. There is no real evidence to support this however, especially fighting against the allied armies in the western front. In the North Africa intro scene, we engage Churchill Mark 7s, which are anachronistic. It was never produced until 1944 and the African theatre ended in 1943. The tactic our Tiger uses to engage the enemy tanks is not accurate. Normally in ambushes, the German tank will hit the lead and rear vehicles to prevent vehicles escaping the ambush. It was standard armed doctrine for any armed force and it was taught in several German handbooks. The tank driver, Kurtz, is wearing the aforementioned Polish WZ-2010 BDU trousers, as well as a German field shirt. Barring the offensively anachronistic trousers, it would be much more accurate if he was wearing a panzer wrap tanker jacket and trousers like Muller and the rest of the crew wears. Our tank commander, Peter Muller, is incorrectly wearing Luftwaffe pilot goggles. The white outline on his officer ranked visor cap should be pink instead, which is the colour for the Vermax tank units. The white outline is for infantry units in this case. 
Muller's shoulder boards imply that he is just an enlisted soldier. If he was a Hopman or Uberleintant, then he'd have two or one rank stars. It is worth mentioning that some officers did wear the shoulder boards of ordinary soldiers to camouflage themselves from snipers. However, in this case, it makes little sense in general, since he always wears his officer visor cap regardless. <laughs> Usually the ordinary tank commanders were NCOs, while officers commanded tank platoons, companies, etc. However, Ur Tiger is never seen as part of a platoon, nor does Muller follow any orders from any tank commander. At one point during the cutscene, a Panzer IV with no gun barrel is seen driving past. Nothing like this would exist in reality. It must have been physically removed by DICE to perhaps try to show Germany's desperation at the stage of World War II or something, but it's kinda just stupid. The Tiger's ignition key, as well as the starter button just above the key in game, are way too undersized. Comparing it to an actual photo shows us the differences. Before he starts driving, Kurt shifts into a ridiculously high 6th or 7th gear. A Tiger can only start from 1st to 4th gear. Muller's Tiger is based on the earlier H variants, which by now would be showing their age and is honestly quite a miracle that it hasn't been replaced by the newer E models yet. His Tiger is also missing a few pieces, such as the exterior smoke launchers on the side of the turret, and has the air filters that were only used in Africa, as well as rubber road wheels which by 1945 would have been worn away by now and replaced with reinforced steel road wheels. It also has an incorrect marking. It should have an S in the middle of it to mark it as a heavy tank. And it is also lacking a company number marking of 2, since he is a part of the 2nd company, 3rd platoon, and the 7th tank. It is worth mentioning that the game never actually directly informs us of what city this story takes part in, with it only telling us that it's in the rural metropolitan area of Germany. However, it is very likely that we are supposed to be fighting in Cologne, as the combination of these unique landmarks, particularly the large cathedral with a huge bridge and railway nearby, cannot be found anywhere in any other major cities in the rhine ruhr region. Furthermore, several websites, videos, and the overall consensus of the fanbase all say the same thing about the actual setting of this campaign being in Cologne, even in the game's wiki page. So we will continue this analysis by counting the city as Cologne. My own personal assumption would be that DICE did not want to directly call it Cologne because they knew, as we will go on to point out, that they recreated the city extremely poorly and so purposefully were vague about telling its location to perhaps try avoid criticism. But you ain't getting away with it on my watch DICE, so let us start with the game's design of Cologne's Hulzarn Bridge, which is more reminiscent of the modern rebuilt version. The version in 1945 had large archways on both ends. Instead of curating Cologne's iconic large cathedral, the devs simply took the growth of St. Lawrencekirt Cathedral assets from the game's multiplayer map Rotterdam in the Netherlands and slapped it in this German city. Compared with reality, the overall layout of Cologne seems to be off, and just like the cathedral, we found that most parts of the city are just reused assets from the Rotterdam map. For example, here we see an above ground station, even though there were none of these in Cologne, apart from the famous Hofbahnhof next to the cathedral, but the size in comparison to the station shown in the game is massive. Peter's Tiger has a crew of four. They even mention in the intro that they are missing a radio operator. Sagen Sie mir, dass wir Nachschub kriegen und einen neuen Funker. Das wäre gelogen, Kerz. Despite this, in the gameplay we hear Hartmann relying orders from the radio to Peter and vice versa. Anton 1, rücken Sie umgehend zum Bahnhof vor. Befehl bestätigen, Hartmann. Ja, Kommandant. But Hartmann is the Tiger's loader, not the radio operator, meaning he is either somehow in two places at once, or is switching seats, which is very difficult to do in any tank, because the turret basket is typically in the way most of the time. On top of this, the radio operator's hull MG will automatically open fire throughout the missions, somehow even after Hartmann leaves our crew in the second mission. For no apparent reason, the aforementioned civilian-style trench coats worn by the German soldiers have now been changed into a strange light blue colour that does not match with any shade of their standard Felgrau uniform colours that they wore in reality. Despite being in a spring setting, a few soldiers are seen wearing winter-coloured white uniforms again. 
Every German armoured vehicle is still painted in the outdated Dunkel Grau dark grey, which is strange for this late in the war, not to mention the weird greyish camo pattern on our Tiger 1. The base colour of the unfinished or no camo ones should be painted in the late 1944 dark red colour instead, or the early 1945 olive green colour. For these missions and the earlier 1944 missions in France, we should also see the vehicles having the common base colour from mid 1943 to late 1944, which was Dunkel Gelb, while the grey colour can be shown in fewer numbers. Although they do look similar to the US M43 jacket, upon investigation we can see that the American soldiers are actually wearing incredibly anachronistic M1965 field jackets with paratrooper pants and chin straps. The American forces that directly attacked Cologne were the 3rd Armored Division along with the 104th Infantry Division, meaning no airborne forces were even in the city. The US forces are seen using British World War I era Vickers Mark I machine guns. The only anti-tank launchers seen used by the Americans are German Panzerfaust. It is possible that they could have captured them from the enemy, but overall most of them should be replaced with the more appropriate M9A1 bazooka. They are also seen somehow reloading them, despite the fact that the Panzerfaust is a single use disposable launcher that cannot be reloaded. Despite being American in origin, the T-17E1 Staghound armoured cars never saw combat service by US forces but only British forces during World War II, so should not be seen mixed along with the American forces in this level. They should instead be M8 Greyhounds in this case. Because the devs were apparently not capable of adding even a single allied AT gun, the one the US forces use are always German Pack 40s the real combat within Cologne was quite a lot lighter in general. The German forces within the city should be mainly composed of remnants of the 363rd Volksgrenadier Division, along with at least two Panther tanks and one Panzer IV from Panzer Brigade 106. So not the huge amounts of Panzer IVs, no Tiger ones, and not the many elite looking troops that we incorrectly see portrayed in game. Additionally, the city was also defended by under-equipped and under-trained civilian militias known as Volksturm, but absolutely none of these appear in-game at all. <laughs> Alongside the aforementioned fictionally designed German Empire flags, we now have slightly more realistic National Socialist banners, but of course with all the swastikas replaced with a Balkan cruise. They have also removed them from all aircraft and uniforms too. To DICE's credit, in terms of story, The Last Tiger is a beautifully told one and a very rare instance of a modern mainstream video game actively humanising the Wehrmacht. They do all this however, but apparently cannot show the big bad symbol because modern German law says so. Many of the US soldiers are seen engaging our tank enthusiastically even with no anti-tank armaments. Sometimes we can even see some of the game's version of British soldiers among the Americans, which would be highly unlikely and not match up with the actual Battle of Cologne. In addition to the points we mentioned earlier in the Tobruk sequence of our Tiger shells having too much drop and the tank's turrets all popping off upon destruction, the Tiger shell, Panzergranata, is able to penetrate over 150mm of armour. At the distance we are shooting at in this level, the shell's HE filler is well over 100 Gs of TNT. However, DICE seems to have nerfed all tank shells because it takes two or sometimes three shells to destroy a tank. Just like it was with the German Panzers, the US soldiers crawling out of the Shermans are wearing the game's version of standard infantry attire instead of any appropriate tanker uniform. It is also worth mentioning that the tank crews would likely be reduced to nothing more than a light mist if their tank suffered an ammo explosion like this, so how they are still even intact afterwards does not make sense. Despite being an American attack, British Royal Air Force the Havilland DH-98 Mosquito Bomber Mark IVs are seen attacking our position in the city. They are often seen flying and attacking our tank way too low to the ground. We even see them clip through buildings. Like something you would expect from a 1950s era film, the Mosquito Bombers make the Stuka diving sounds. despite obviously not having the Jericho trumpets. 
The Walter P-38's firing pin is missing. Do US soldiers have M1928A1 Thompsons? While prevalent during the early stages of the war, US soldiers in Europe would have M1 or M1A1 Thompsons. The 20 round stick mag on the Thompson somehow holds 30 rounds. M1A1 carbines appear among the regular American infantry, despite being mainly used by the US airborne forces in reality. Although there are some exceptions, it should be much fewer and rarer. Despite being their main service weapon at the time, the M1 Garand never appears anywhere in this mission. There is also a complete absence of BARs, grease guns, regular M1 carbines, and infantry used Browning M1919s. And of course, nothing changed in the campaign even after DICE added many of these weapons in the Pacific update. Instead of having their usual MK2 grenades, the US forces throw bundles of German steel hand granatas at us. Among the German supply crates we can find World War I era British Lewis guns. Its appearance is actually somewhat possible in this scenario, since German forces regularly made use of captured weapons, helmets and uniforms, especially during the later stages of the war due to supply shortages. However, as you may have noticed with many of the older weapons, they are seen completely covered in rust, to the point that it's a miracle that they even fully operate correctly. Some of the American soldiers are armed with British Lee Enfield No. 4 Mark I rifles for some reason. Mass public executions of deserters and accused defeatists did happen towards the end of the war in Germany. For example, the execution of Edelweiss pirates in November 1944 at Cologne. However, we can't find evidence to support such things also happening within the city during the three-day battle of Cologne, despite quite a few records of hanged civilians and soldiers alike in other German cities in 1945. In disguise are literally hundreds of German Ju-88 bombers flying alongside, in formation with, Allied C-47s. The Luftwaffe at this stage would not even have enough fuel to fly this many aircraft. It is likely that this fighting sequence around the cathedral area is inspired by the famous tank duel in Cologne, which was lucky enough to be caught on camera. However, the real tank battle is very different from the game's version, which is likely made up for the plot. The prime differences would be that the German tank was a panther tank, commanded by Wilhelm Bartelbort instead of our fictional Tiger 273, along with there being a missing appearance of the brand new American Pershing tank that was prominently involved in the real battle. During this battle, Shermans with sandbags on them show up, and they are somehow considerably stronger than the already unrealistically resistant normal ones, taking twice as many shots to destroy, still at an extremely close range. US forces were known to cover their Shermans in such objects, but it did not offer any such dramatic extra protection, other than from some shaped charge attacks like the Panzerfaust. The Hohenzollern Bridge was destroyed by German forces during the fighting in Cologne. However, it was likely that it was demolished before the actual tank battle, not afterwards, and it also happened during the daytime, not night. The commander's interior light shouldn't flash red, its purpose is only for interior lighting. The only flashing red light is next to the driver for the ignition. Same goes for the alarm we hear. The only alarm should be for the driver. Judging from the name of this war story and the way our Tiger 273 ended up crashing in the rubble here, we can assume that the tank was loosely inspired by the actual Tiger 1 number 323 of the Muchenberg Panzer Division that ended up being abandoned in front of the Brandenburg Gate at the southern side of the Reichstag during the last days of the battle in Berlin against the surrounding Soviet forces. This particular Tiger 1 was actually sometimes referred to as the last Tiger in combat, not the fictional one we see in game. In the game's finishing epilogue, a Churchill gun carrier is spotted. Only 50 were built in total, with none seeing any combat. And the final shot of this awful mess of a game is of a British paratrooper jumping out of a RAF C-47 into the Battle of Nijmegen, wearing a completely incorrect uniform, including what looks to be a RFC hat from Battlefield 1. And so, without even touching this game's multiplayer... Hello, old friend. 
we are left with a total of well over 300 historical inaccuracies. Again, thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to play it now for free using my link in the pinned comment or description for all new and returning players that haven't played in 6 months to receive a massive bonus pack across all platforms, available for a limited time only. For more inaccuracies, check out this video where we analyze the hilariously inaccurate Call of Duty Black Ops 1. Massive thanks to our research team including Davidson, Carabini, K9, Verizon, Munancho Inc and GI Combat. Thank you for making it all the way through this feature film a length of a video. This has been the Frosty One, out.